Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for doing this interview. I'm Juliet Galatly, the founder and director of Viva, um, reporting for Plant Based News. One of the first questions I wanted to ask you was We're in the sixth mass extinction. Scientists have shown, and I quote, Livestock production is the single largest driver of habitat loss and both livestock and feed crop production are increasing in developing tropical countries where the majority of biological diversity resides. And then we have Joseph Poor from Oxford University who studied 40,000 farms across the world and found that a vegan diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on planet Earth and he goes in to say why. Why do you think, with that knowledge that we now have amongst the scientific community, which governments across the world know too, why aren't more scientists, politicians, and in fact the media shouting out from the rooftops that one of the answers within our grasps, which is to change ourselves and be vegan? Firstly, um, I'm gonna ask you to change your vernacular. <laughs> because I think it's really important that we're precise with words. Mm -hmm. So it's common parlance to say that we're in a six mass extinction event. Mm -hmm. I prefer six mass extermination event because it's us that are exterminating the rest of the world's biodiversity. And ultimately, if we continue to do so ourselves in the process. So I, I see that it's, it's not an accidental thing. I, I, I'm irked when I read that we are losing species. It's not that we're losing them, we're destroying them. You know, we're either actively killing them or we're taking away their habitat or other resources and, and therefore making it so that life is no longer tenable for them. It's, 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 it's not accidental, it's, it's down to us. To answer your question, I, I fear that the single biggest problem that we face, and it doesn't just pertain to this issue, is that the human species is a remarkably intelligent and adaptable, resourceful um, species, but one significant handicap that it has is that it, it can't change its mind very easily. Um, so all of the facts, all of the figures can be put on the table by people um, like those you've cited, who, who we trust to produce top quality um, independent research upon which we should make best informed decisions. But unfortunately, people uh, are, are very slow to change their minds. And if you push them too hard, they can become quite intransigent and then push back rather than even thinking about the, the thought of, of changing their minds. And I think the other thing that we have to reconcile, and whether this is an artifact of our age and the situation that we face, I, I don't know. Only history will be able to answer that. But we are living in exceptional times and globally we have a very unexceptional group of leaders. Mm. We're just not armed at this point with governors at just about any level on this planet who are clearly in a position to make rational and intelligent decisions about what we should be doing right now. Mm. Um, in one second, because it's just grabbing you and you're talking to some of the oh, good stuff. I don't want that to yeah, continue. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I suppose we could sit around moaning about that, mm. as we frequently do, but it achieves so little. Or uh, we can do what we must at this point, and that is we, the citizens who, in democracies at least, have voted for these people, must let them know what we think. We, I mean, they are ostensibly our elected representatives. They have been elected to represent us. Mm. So it's really important at this critical time that we don't imagine that they will fix it. I don't think they're going to fix it at all. I think we will have to push them to fix it. And in the meantime, we should get on with fixing as much of it as we possibly can ourselves. And that's why self-empowerment is so important. And that's why vegan camp out is so important. This is a collective of people who've actively made decisions to change their minds. They've summoned the, the courage maybe, or you know, the, the, um, the, the integrity to, to be able to change their minds. And they've done that mostly independently. Yeah. And that fortitude is something that we here need to celebrate. Mm. You know, it's not just about like-minded people coming together in that community. This is, to me, is the source of celebration mm. because this, pr this proves that there is hope for us mm. to, you know, 
make a difference. Do you think people understand the power that they have? Do you think that maybe people are used to things being a certain way so much and lack respect for authority now and are so used to being, excuse my language, but shat upon that they don't realise the power that they have to change things? Oh, and I, I, think you're, I think you're very much right. I think we've endured years now of you know, and again, I'm speaking globally here, not just about the UK, uh, but years of political abuse. We've been ignored. We've had, you know, people saying, I've had enough of experts. It goes against everything that I stand for and have stood for since I, you know, sat down to take my O-levels. Development of expertise, the acquisition of knowledge so that we can make best informed decisions for ourselves and for our species and planet. It is the is the grail that we should be chasing at the moment, not ignoring that. But I think you're right. People are disenfranchised. They're disempowered. Um, they they they're disconnected from. I think you know the idea that their voice will ever matter, and that's why we 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 face such what seems to be pervasive apathy. But what we've got to remember is that we don't need everyone to change their minds. Again, science, um, analysis of, of populations and how a, a population of, of humans does change its mind, tell us that effectively we need 25% of those people. Um, and once 25% mm -hmm. have changed their mind about something which they previously believed was the opposite, um, then it cascades very quickly. And by the time you get to about 27%, uh, then you're on a roll. And in a very short space of time, the entire population will change. The problem when it comes to campaigning of the likes of which that you're involved in and, and I'm involved in is that we don't ever know where, where we are. We don't know if we're 24.9 or, or we're, you know, or 2.49. You know, that's the problem. And so the only way to overcome that is, and I don't need to tell you this because you, because you continue, is that you've just got to keep going. And what I always say to people is winning right, is about not giving up. It's not ever thinking that you're going to get to a point where you can sit down um, and have a sandwich and a day off. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not going to happen. There's always going to be some other issue which we will have to confront and try and put right. So our uh, you know, only method of getting to 25% is never giving up. And that, I think, is something that, that mindset is something that I think we need to communicate more effectively so that we can get to the 25%. Because the more people who realize that they are personally empowered to make a difference, then basically, when they see a community of like-minded people, whether that's physically, like here at the camp out, or on social media, maybe, or in, in some other way that they can receive and react to, then they will recognize that you know we do have voices mm. we, we do have power mm. and one of the beauties of course of veganism is that you're in control of yourself you walk into that shop and you have the power to choose it's much less frustrating than some other issues where you're trying to lobby a politician which god forbid you know <laughs> is so difficult so you really do have the power in terms of what you choose every time you shop i think that you know uh, going back to your, your figures that you had at the, at the outset about global agriculture and its impact on biodiversity loss and also climate change as well, of course. Uh, what we've got to remember here is that, um, you know, our closest connection with the natural world, um, which occurs, if we're lucky, every day, is what we put in our mouths. Because whatever it is has been produced, either directly or indirectly, by Ecosystem Services Earth. It's either been farmed or it's been harvested. It, it hasn't magically appeared from outer space. It's come from somewhere on our planet. And it's effectively at some point come out of the ground, out of the soil. And so, you know, if we, and, and that's what connects us. I, I think we're grotesquely disconnected because people, one, don't know where their food comes from. And secondly, un and unfortunately and insidiously, they can't know because food labeling is so appalling that you know, you, it's very difficult for people, even if they want to make good choices, to stand in a supermarket aisle in the UK mm -hmm. and to look at a label and to be 100% confident that they are buying sustainably produced food or as close to it as, as they can get. Mm -hmm. Food labeling is one of the greatest banes of our life, it, the inadequacies of food labeling. And I think that if we were, if you were to say, Chris, you've got a magic wand, um, what would you do when it comes to this issue that we're talking about? Um, I, 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 that's what I'd go for. I'd say, really sorry, you know, I want a, 
if you're going to eat meat, I want, a, I want a picture on the cover. Like, you know, if you're going to smoke cigarettes, I want to see what the lungs are going to look like if you've smoked them for 40 years. If, if, if there were cover on pictures on the food of where those animals have been living, significantly larger numbers of people wouldn't buy it. And that's a fact. Absolutely. And just the fact that, you know, processed meat is labelled now um, a class one carcinogen. Why isn't that on the labelling of bacon? Well, you know, we need reminding of that all the time. In terms of factory farming, um, was it factory farming that motivated you to first go vegetarian or was it something else? That was the early 90s, wasn't it? No, I, I mean, I, I've been vegetarian since my early 20s. I, I, I thought I would basically just cut down on meat. But then I found that when, if I ate meat after a sort of six month break, um, it made me ill actually. So I sort of thought, well, that's, that method is off the menu. So let's just forget about the meat. And then I carried on eating fish, but of course got to the point as, I mean, I, I got older when we recognized that our fish stocks are, you know, to say they're seriously imperiled, you know, is, is an understatement of enormous magnitude. They're on the brink, many of them. You know, eight uh, out of 10 of our fisheries are overfished. So then it became clear to me that eating fish was, you know, unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And I never, I never towed this line with the fact that fish didn't feel pain and, and all of this nonsense. So again, from a scientific point of view, you, you wouldn't entertain that in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing is it was factory farming that fi finally pushed me from vegetarianism to veganism. Mm -hmm. And I went to an all indoor dairy unit. Now it was spick and span. It was remarkably clean. None of the animals were being uh, uh, you know, abused, although genetically I might argue that they have been in the, in, in the, in the past, um, given the rather bizarre shape of them. Um, so in, in, that, uh, the, in that sense, uh, you wouldn't say that there were any immediate husbandry issues. In, in, but the, the fact is that these animals never went outside. <laughs> Right. They did three lactation cycles. Right. They have their calves taken away instantaneously. Um, I just came, I'd never been to one before and I should have done. And, 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 it, and, and honestly, it was as close to Brave New World, mm -hmm. which I'd read as a 14 year old, that I could ever imagine. And I, and I got in the car that night after spending the day there. And um, and that was it. I, I, I never I, it was over. Mm -hmm. The game was over. You know, I knew that I couldn't trust myself or the food labeling, anyone else, to be able to access good quality, organically produced, animal husbandry friendly dairy products. You know, I'm sure that they might exist out there. And, and there were certainly, you know, there were cases for us to transition away from livestock farming, because at the moment in many areas, livestock farming is actually helping biodiversity. So we're looking at transition, not overnight cessation. But I, I don't have a lifestyle where I would be able to do those things. And ultimately, um, you know, then the second part of the issue comes in, um, which is, well, for me, there were three parts, but the second part comes in, which is the environment. And, and, and you've, you've, you've stated all of the figures. You can't make an environment, environmental case for, for the amount of meat and dairy consumption that we have at the moment. So I can't tell you, I can't stop you from doing, because as you say, it's you, what you put in your mouth, but I can, I can control what I do. Yeah. And if I'm not in control of myself, how am I gonna be in a position where I will aim to ask people to do something which I think is a better idea? Yeah, yeah. In fact, Viva, we investigated dairy farming for Cadbury and went in trying to remember it was either 13 or 15 dairy farms and every single one was zero grazed for Cadbury, um, one of the biggest names in the world. And I did find it quite shocking. You know, these animals, like you say, they never see a blade of grass. And that is one of the reasons, don't you think, people still like to think of the rural idyll in Britain, this sort of, um, you know, the contentment of these bucolic scenes and all the rest of it. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. Why do you think we have this cognitive dissonance where, you know, from a very young age, obviously people are encouraged to love their pets uh, and respect wildlife, but with farmed animals, we can do anything we like to them. Really. Well, I, I, you've said it, it's conditioning, isn't it? We are conditioned to think as say, a dog and a cat as a companion animal, uh, but a pig as something we eat. Well, it never worked for me, to be quite honest with you, because if you look at those organisms and you look at their, you know, um, not that it should be a, in any way a parameter for us to judge, but let's just say their intelligence, for instance. I mean, um, we know that pigs are exceptionally intelligent animals. 
you know. So to try and pretend that they don't know what's happening to them in those sometimes hor horrendous conditions that they're farmed in is, is nonsensical. But again, it's one of these cultural conditioned things. It's fish don't feel pain. That doesn't matter. Um, it's, you know, and, and, and people are justifiably really upset about, you know, uh, East Asian people eating dogs. That's enough complete affront to our sensibilities. Our dogs, they share our lives, they share our beds, they share our food, they share, you know, our, our love. So the idea that we would, you know, boil them and eat them is horrendous. <laughs> Frankly, folks, what's the difference between a dog and a pig? You tell me. I mean, I don't, I know the difference, obviously, in terms of the species, but that's, it's, it's utter nonsense. And, and, and if we had ever set ourselves up to think, okay, we are going to consume these animals and therefore we are going to essentially mass produce them, um, then that doesn't in any way or shouldn't in any way detract from the fact that that should be done or should have been done in, in, in a respectful way, where we respect the needs of those animals, both physically and mentally. And I think it's very clear that if you go into the vast majority of those factory farms, intensive agriculture now, that, that those standards are not met at all. And the only reason that these people persist is because it's hidden. And if it weren't for people like yourself and other organizations, you know, showing people what is really going on behind those closed shed doors, then they would be, carry on blissfully ignorant because we, we don't go to the farm to get our food anymore. We go to a shed which is just full of plastic and packaging with stuff that we put in our faces which probably isn't doing us much good and certainly hasn't been doing those animals any good. Just switching subjects slightly to the badger call, you've done so much and been so outspoken and so brilliant and thank you, so, you know, from the bottom of my heart for what you've done. Um, really bringing this to the attention of the people, but I wondered in terms of you know the government's pronouncements on this and the fact that badgers are still being killed, how that makes you feel personally? How does it affect you, the man? Um, I feel an enormous sense of shame um, and a colossal sense of failure. But then it's only adding to the colossal sense of failure that I manifest when I tell you that since 1970, when I remember, um, you know, Pele nearly scoring against Gordon Banks in colour, actually, on our first colour television. So that's in a tangible period of time that I can remember, okay, when we don't live very long, and our lifespans in the grand scheme of things aren't really that important. But in that short period of time, we've lost nearly 70% of the world's wildlife. And from 1980 onwards, just 10 years later, I would have said that I was a fledgling active conservationist. And by certainly 1990, I would have been someone who was certainly trying to drive conservation as hard as I possibly could. So uh, we've lost all those animals. We've lost 90 million birds from the UK countryside. We've lost, nine, I mean, I, you know, people like me are armed with all of those statistics. 95% of our, 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 our collared doves. You know, in some areas, 97% of our hedgehogs. Our hedgehogs, for goodness sake. Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Um, and, and so, no, I'm, I'm afraid. And, and I think that actually UK conservation as a whole will carry the badger cull as a terrible tattoo of, of, of failure for, for a long time. But then look, you know, the badger cull has persisted um, because it, it became a political decision, not a science-based decision. Absolutely. And I was going to ask you that, how that makes you feel that government repeatedly do this, that, you know, they, 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 they bow to the pressures of, you know, an agricultural lobby rather than look at the science and are prepared to destroy, annihilate practically, or massacre at least, you know, our beloved wildlife. It's absolutely sickening. Um, but then I was brought up never to trust authority, always to question authority. Um, politely and democratically, but consistently, you know, challenge authority. Because, you know, it, it was really clear to me as a young teenager that, that anyone who had a vested interest in either keeping things the same or making them worse was someone to be feared. You know, and, and again, you know, we talked about the magic wand. 
Um, if you were to give me a magic wand and say, OK, you can make one change to our system of governance in the UK and perhaps in many other parts of the world too, certainly in Europe, um, what would it be? I'd say no more lobbying. We're electing people who will be informed by other people who should be justifiably qualified to give them the best advice and that should come independently, independently. Not because they're having their ears bent every five minutes by someone who's got a vested interest in making large sums of money and perpetuating suffering and perhaps endangering our planet and, and our own species. And that's what I see happening. And there is no ambiguity about it. But we, 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 we tolerate it. Mm. Do you think that we should be working with global corporations? For example, um, a lot of factory farming is owned now by transnational corporations. Do you think we should be working with them to change them? Do you think we should be working within the political system as it is? Or do you think we should be looking for a whole, <laughs> the term, the new world order? Do you, do you think there has to be a revolution? Well, I, 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 don't, I, I haven't seen a revolution that's ever gone particularly well, to be quite honest with you. So I'm really hoping that isn't going to happen. Um, and even when we've talked about velvet revolutions, there's always been a metal fist inside the velvet glove and it hasn't, it hasn't gone well. Um, I'm, I'm up for conversation, creative prog uh, progress and democratic change. And how important do you think within that, that people understand the importance of being vegan themselves, or at least on that way? Well, I think that, you know, from, from that point of view, you've made a conscious decision yourself. Mm -hmm. You've made a change. You've changed your mind. Your, the impact of you changing your mind is collectively, you get a lot of people here have all changed their mind, that's having an impact on the market. We know that because we can see the increase in, say, plant-based milks, you know, which were, I mean, I don't know the history of that, but a few years ago, there were hardly any. Now the growth is continued and sustained every year. And that's because people here, people like you and I are making those decisions. So we are having an impact. Mm -hmm. We've got to register that and, and feel not ever complacent but that you've got to allow that to build our confidence that we can make a difference because we are going to have to make that difference again that's what we're coming down to I don't trust well I was going to say anyone I don't trust the vast majority of our governors everything from local council through to you know global conglomerates of, of, of politicians um, to make those decisions for us, because I consistently see them either not making a decision or making the wrong one. And, we're, and, there's, and again, we live in an age where they can't hide. There is no ambiguity about that. It's so easy for you and I now to access the truth, and it's equally easy for us to disseminate the truth because we've got social media and, and everything else. So what's quite astonishing to me, and to many people, I'm sure, is that um, they continue to get away with it. But then again, that's good, you see, because I don't know about you, but when I see people getting away with something, which I, you know, which I know is wrong, that gets me out of bed five minutes earlier every day. I can't stand people getting away with a, essentially a crime, if you see what I mean. You must be getting up very early then. <laughs> mm, I'll try. What is your hope? What is your hope? Um, you know, how, how would you envisage um, Britain being in 20, 30 years? What is your hope? Uh, uh, to be honest, Increasingly, and, and particularly over the last two years, um, conjuring a vision like that has become increasingly frightening, if I'm honest with you. Because I think I've seen very significant opportunities, you know, uh, have, been, have come and been lost. And I think we've had a global interruption with, with COVID, um, which has set us back in terms of some of the progress that we were making, unfortunately. So now we need to pick ourselves up, shake ourselves off and think about how we approach addressing some of the really urgent issues, but in a new way, because the world has changed post COVID, obviously. And so we need to adapt to that. That was something that we um, should have seen coming, but none of us really did. Um, I, I think if I'm very honest with you, and again, this is based on uh, a historical perspective just looking at our species and how it behaves. Um, we're, we're brilliant at cure. We got a vaccine for COVID in less than a year. 
you know, in some places it's been rolled out. It's saving people's lives. Whenever we've been confronted with, you know, really significant problems, we've come up with solutions, you know. Um, so we have that capacity, but when, so we're, great, we're really good at cure, but we're rubbish at prevention. It always seems that we need to trip over and hurt ourselves, you know, before we decide to sort something out. But what I struggle with at the moment is that every day I, I look at social media, I turn on mainstream media, and I see our species hurting. I see Australia on fire. I see North America on fire. I see Cyprus and Greece on fire. I see people losing their lives, their livelihoods. I see vast swathes of forest being you know, burned. And then I see the flooding. And then I see, my sister sends me a picture on her mobile phone. She lives in London, looking out of her window, and there were cars floating past. And I think, hold on, people, it's not over there. It, it's, it's here, and also it's here. We're all a part of it. You can't, you know, at what point are enough of us going to pull our heads out of the sand and say, we've got, we, we can't put up with any more of this, um, we're, we're going to change now. And I think that's what will happen. I think it will get to a point where we are sufficiently uncomfortable. We'll see. We'll see what happens, Chris. But thank you for everything that you do. Um, you, somebody that I've respected for, for many, many years. So it's yeah. a real pleasure to have this chance to chat with you. Thank you.